their data is being processed outside but if the data the data principles are within the territory of india then they would fall under the purview of the act the act does not apply to processing of data for personal or domestic purposes and of course it does not apply to publicly available personal data the objective of the act is to process digital personal data the act is it empowers the data principles it recognizes the rights of the data principles and um, it solely focuses on the protection of their personal data it also recognizes the need to process the personal data for lawful purposes all of these things are stated in detail as you go through the act um let's focus on a, a few key definitions which are useful for our purpose um there are a lot of new definitions which have been included in the new act however for the purpose of this presentation for us as data fiduciaries uh, the most important definition of course is of data um the highlight of this definition is that they have said what data is which is information facts concepts opinions whatever is whatever processing is done by human beings or by automated means will become a part of data and digital personal data will be personal data which is in a digital form uh, the most important definition is of uh, data fiduciaries which is any person who determines the purpose and means of processing personal data which is all of us at this point data principle as i said is the individual to whom the personal data relates to it can be a child which includes the parents or lawful guardian of a child because um the child is under 18 so for that matter of time it will be the parents of the lawful guardian and also it can be a person with disability which also includes their lawful guardian acting on her behalf and data processor is any person who processes personal data on behalf of a data fiduciary so if you are a data fiduciary and if you appoint someone to process the data on your behalf then that person or that entity would become a data processor these are the key definitions if there are any doubts regarding the same please feel free to ask any questions um is everyone clear with the concepts of data fiduciary principal and processor let's uh, let's move on to the next slide so the act lays down a very detailed uh, consent framework um it is the obligation of a data fiduciary to take consent from the data principal before processing the data it is a must this compliance has to be done by data fiduciary this consent should be free informed unconditional and the main point is that it should be a clear affirmative action which means that there has to be a proper precise explicit affirmative action from the data principal when he or she consents to the processing of their data the act has also uh, i request everyone to please mute themselves because it's causing a lot of uh, disturbance okay the act has also uh, laid down a purpose limitation wherein the consent which is sought for should be only for such specified purposes which is necessary to process their data so basically you cannot take consent and then process the data for purposes other than the one for which the consent was sought for if you do that you will be in violation of the act so please make sure that you stick to the specified purposes and the consent should be limited to only those purposes um also the consent should be limited to such personal data which is necessary for the specified purpose so there's a purpose clear cut purpose limitation which is laid down in the act also the act has introduced the concept of a consent manager who is a person which is registered with the board consent if you are aware of um, the abdm architecture hicm which is the health information exchange consent manager would fall under this category a consent manager is basically a single point of contact which enables the data principal to give manage review withdraw their consent through a platform that the consent manager would provide this consent manager shall be accountable to the data principal and shall act on her behalf 
uh, YT is going to lay down the rules in future uh, regarding the checks and balances, the duties and obligations of the consent manager, how they're supposed to register themselves with the board. So that is the part of consent manager. Um, a very yeah. <coughs> for those who would have gone through the bill which was laid down for consultation, there was a section pertaining to deem consent. So in the act, they have construed that whole concept under the idea of certain legitimate uses, wherein a data fiduciary may also process the data of the data principle for any of the uses which they have, which are listed over here. Wherein an explicit consent might not be necessary. I'll give a few examples to make it clear. So, for example, if you look at the first point, uh, a data principal has voluntarily provided her personal data and she has not indicated that she does not consent to the processing of her data. So, for example, if I go to a hospital, I provide my details, I provide my contact number, I provide all my personal details. <coughs> Okay, again, I please request everyone to mute themselves. Yeah, so if I go to a hospital, I provide my personal information. And if the hospital processes the data for the purpose of treatment, then the the hospital can process my data because I voluntarily provided my personal information and I have not explicitly refused consent to not process my data. So that would fall under the purview of certain legitimate uses. One more instance would be wherein a state or any instrumentality of a state while issuing any subsidy, benefit, service, certificate, license or permit under those circumstances the data fiduciary can process the data of the data principle without an explicit consent. More, uh, the, the other certain legitimate uses would be for performance of any law or for fulfilling any obligation under any law, for compliance with any judgment or decree which is issued under any law. Um, this might be of interest for all of us, wherein in order to respond to a medical emergency, which involves a threat to life or immediate threat to health of the data principle, under such circumstances, an explicit consent of the data principle is not necessary. It would fall under the purview of certain legitimate uses and the data can be processed of the data principle. It can also be done for provision of medical treatment or health services during an epidemic, during the outbreak of any disease or any threat to public health. It can also be done for taking measures to ensure safety in case of any disaster or any breakdown in public order and for purpose of employment and employment safety. Um, moving on. Now, this is uh, the part which concerns all of us as data fiduciaries. Even we fall under this, you fall under this. So please be mindful of this. The obligations of data fiduciary, first of all, the act lays down the grounds for processing personal data, wherein every data fiduciary has to keep in mind that the personal data will be processed in compliance with the provisions of the act for a lawful purpose with the consent of the data principle or for certain legitimate uses, which I mentioned in the previous slide. If you do all of these things, if you follow these four pointers, you can process the personal data. The, it is the onus of the data principle, uh, of the data, I'm sorry, of the data fiduciary to make sure that they provide a notice to the data principle either at the time or before obtaining consent, this is a compliance which needs to be followed. The components of a notice will include the personal data which is being collected and why you are collecting that personal data, the rights which the data principal can exercise, the manner in which she can make a complaint with the board. All of these things fall under a notice. You have to make sure that if you are furnishing a notice, you keep in mind that all of these pointers become a part of your notice. And it has kind of a retrospective effect where the act has said that if the data has been processed before the commencement of the act, then the act gives the data fiduciary a reasonable time. The reasonable time is not defined under the act, but the data fiduciary must furnish a notice within a reasonable time to the data principal. If you have already started processing the data, 
before the commencement of the act and the data fiduciary may continue processing the data until the data process principle withdraws the consent. The notice is to be provided in English or any language as per the eighth schedule of the constitution, which means that you have, there will be instances wherein you might have to provide the notice in someone's local language. And if they wish to have a notice in their own language, then you have to make sure that you comply with the same. So again, just to summarize, you can process the data in compliance with the act for a lawful purpose with consent or for legitimate uses. And before processing the data, you need to make sure that you furnish a notice to the data principal where you make them aware as to why you are collecting the data and what data is being collected and what are their rights and the manner in which they can make a complaint with the board. All of this should be done either in English or in their own language. Moving on. So these are the general obligations of the data fiduciary. Again, this is a very important aspect of the act. All the data fiduciaries need to make sure, the act has mentioned a lot of times that you need to make sure that you comply with the provisions of the act. So we need to keep in mind that at no point do we contravene any of the provisions of the act. The act also allows the data fiduciary to appoint a data processor. As we said that data processor is an entity which will process personal data on behalf of the data fiduciary only under a valid contract. The data fiduciary must also ensure the completeness, the accuracy and consistency of the data where the data affects the data principle or if the data fiduciary is disclosing the data to some other data fiduciary. So for example, if I'm a hospital and if I'm transferring the data of the patient to some other hospital for better treatment, I need to make sure as a data fiduciary that the data is complete, it is accurate and it is consistent. The data fiduciary should also implement appropriate technical and organizational measures to ensure that the, the provisions of the act are complied with. The act, time and again, has mentioned that there are a lot of aspects for which there will be further rules which will be published. So we need to wait for the rules which will come in the future. Um, the data fiduciary should also take reasonable uh, security safeguards, of course, to protect personal data which they have in their possession or if the data which is processed by the data processor on their behalf they have to make sure that security safeguards are taken for the data which is processed by the data processor as well so this onus is also kind of on the data fiduciary where they have to ensure that data processor in no way is in breach with the provisions of the act if there is an event of data breach the data fiduciary must intimate the data principle. Even if there are a lot of data principles in the event of the data breach, you have to make sure that you intimate each and every data principle about the breach. This is the next provision is with regard to retention, wherein it has been mentioned that the data fiduciary must erase the personal data when the data principle either withdraws the consent or if the specified purpose for which the data was collected is completed, then it is the obligation of the data fiduciary to erase the personal data unless it is necessary for compliance with any law. So this is kind of an exception because we understand that in hospitals or in a, in a healthcare setting, there might be data which might be necessary for a prolonged period of time. So it kind of gets covered under this ex exception, where if it is necessary for compliance with any law, you can retain the data for a longer period of time. The same should be complied with the data processor as well, which is appointed by the data fiduciary. The data of the data fiduciary must also publish contact details of the data protection officer and establish an effective grievance redressal mechanism. So these are the main pointers that you have to keep in mind while complying with the provisions of the act uh, as a uh, data fiduciary. Um, next slide. Yeah. Moving on, the act has also kind of classified a segment of data fiduciaries as significant data fiduciaries. So if you fall under the category of a significant data fiduciary, then there are a few more checks and balances. It's not a lot, it's fairly 
reasonable if you think about it. So basically, the central government will notify data fiduciary or a class of data fiduciaries as significant data fiduciaries based on the six pointers which are mentioned, which is the volume and sensitivity of the personal data that you are processing. So if you're processing a lot of data and if it is sensitive data, so health data as per our understanding falls under this category. Um, or if the risk to the rights of the data principle is more in the event of a data breach or if the potential impact on the sovereignty and integrity of India or if there's a risk to electoral democracy, if there is a question on the security of the state or general public order, you will fall under the category of a significant data fiduciary. Again, it is not up to us to decide whether we are that or not, the central government will notify the data fiduciary or the class of data fiduciaries as significant data fiduciary. So the significant data fiduciary shall have to comply with a few pointers, uh, starting with the appointment of a data protection officer in their own uh, fu internal functioning in, in, an, in their organization. Um, the data protection officer should be based in India. Uh, he or she will be an individual responsible to the board of directors or a similar governing body of the significant data fiduciary. And they will be the point of contact for grievance redressal mechanism. The significant data fiduciary shall also appoint an independent data auditor to carry out data audit. And they will undertake some other measures, which is periodic data protection impact assessment, carry out periodic audit, and any other measures which they see is that they are necessary for their internal functioning. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah. So this is what a significant data fiduciary must do. That's it. If you remember in PDP bill, there were a lot of other bonuses which were laid down on them, but in the new act, it's fairly easy. I'm sure all of us might be complying with half of these. <coughs> well, uh, moving forward, uh, we know that uh, children data are more sensitive in nature and they have to be taken care with uh, more uh, security measure so here in uh, as per the act whenever a person is uh, trying to process the data of a children they have to adhere to these particular provisions which has been enabled specifically for the child which clearly mentioned that data fiduciary before processing the uh, personal data of a child or a person with disability <laughs> has to obtain a verifiable consent from parent or lawful guardian. And secondly, for uh, specifically uh, entitled uh, in persons to the children, data fiduciary has to take care that uh, no data fiduciary is uh, make, uh, generating any kind of uh, process, which is the, going to be detrimental uh, with the well-being of a child and no such advertisements uh, in a nature is being uh, advertised, which is going to monitor or target or uh, have a tracking uh, <laughs> mode of uh, behavior pertaining to children. This is one of the uh, obligations of the data fiduciary too. So moving ahead, Ashka will take care. Hi, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. So this was the end of today's session for presentation as we would love to have a lot of discussion and Q&A on the same. However, to summarize whatever we have taken you through today, starting with the overview of the entire uh, data protection framework, moving on to the applicability of the act, the objective of the act, and the consent framework wherein either you have to take an explicit consent and you, with an affirmative action or the certain legitimate uses which have been laid down in the act, wherein you can process the data. And also we spoke about the obligations and duties of the data fiduciary, wherein you have to process the data with consent for a lawful purpose or for legitimate uses. And you have to furnish a notice. 
and the other general obligations that we spoke about and your duty if you fall under the category of a significant data fiduciary. And as uh, my colleague Anubhav said, that while processing personal data of children, that also falls under a very important obligation of the data fiduciary, as it is, again, a very sensitive um, uh, type of a data. So yeah, that concludes the presentation for today, which is the first half of um, the seminar. So we would love to hear from you this point forward. Oh. Thank you. Okay, I see a lot of people are raising their hands. So, can we have Amrit Singh? Can you please unmute yourself and ask a question? Yes, uh, <laughs> yes. Kamar, my question is this: that uh, is, is there any document that specifies that under because there's a joint liability between the doctors and let's say an HMIS player, as far as basically the there could be a co fiduciary between the two. So, is there any document or anything, any light you can shed that in what situations the liability liability will fall on the doctor and in what situations the liability may fall on the HMIS player if there's some basically uh, mishap takes place with the data? So, hi Amrit. Uh, no specific document as such what you are looking for is presently with us. Beside, uh, it will always depend on the contract which you will enter with the uh, other stakeholder while you are processing the data. And uh, we are also looking forward to certain rules which uh, central government will uh, provide in such scenarios. So uh, that's what the present scenario is pertaining to your question. And if anything else you would like to add, Kavadeep Ashka. No, I think we would have to wait for the rules also, which. Oh, no specific document of such is as of now. Uh, thank you, Amrit. Uh, can we, uh, Mr. Umesh, could you please kindly unmute yourself and ask a question? Uh, thank you, sir. I am uh, Umesh Bulgi, Dr. Umesh Bulgi from Nice HMS. So I have actually three questions, sir. One is how long a vendor, that is an HMS supplier should store the data after the hospital uh, stops paying his subscription. For example, if it takes for two years, he stops paying subscription. So the vendor, the, how long he should keep or maintain the data or he can delete it off because holding a data is a responsibility and adds the cost to the vendor. He may, if he wants to choose to delete, uh, because the hospital people may not respond to us when they stop paying us. So how long the vendor should keep the data with him? There's the first question, sir. And the second question is, the hospital should... Uh, 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 sir, you have said about something like data protection officer uh, in the hospital. And uh, what is the significant data protection at what level the hospital should maintain? Like if the hospital is, or a clinic is a single man owned, or a hospital with a 10 bedded, or hospital 50 bedded, 100 bedded, what is it, at what level you expect this uh, separate officer the hospital should maintain, and and the hospital is not following ABDM compliance. Is this necessary? Still necessary. And the third is about PHR responsibility for the uh, holding the data. The how should we assure our patients that the PHR people will not share the data with the insurance? That's what we. These are three questions I have, sir. Uh, sorry, Umesh, uh, your third question was how shall uh, PH? Uh, could you please repeat because that? About my own patients were concerned about sharing the, although he had an address, he did not register it because he said, he, when you share the data, it will go to one or other PHR. From there, it may reach the insurance people. And uh, my uh, annual pay for the installment may go up. He was not uh, letting me do it. This has happened. So that's why I wanted to know, how should we convince our patients your data will not reach the insurance because health claim exchange is coming. We should convince the patient that your health uh, uh, through any PHR app, it will not reach the insurance. That uh, that mechanism we wanted to know, sir. Because as a doctor, as a uh, vendor also, I am playing a dual play and I can feel the both sides. How should I uh, convince our patients that this will not reach? That is the third one. But first, we will the DPDP discussion. Um, hi, Umesh. So yes, sir. Uh, answering all your questions. The first one was regarding the storage of data. 
So After basically, the substitution over. Yes, sir. Um, so basically, the act is kind of silent. They have just said that if I, as a data principal, if I withdraw my consent, or if the purpose for which I understand that health data is something where the purpose might be endless, or the purpose might extend towards the lifetime of a patient. So that is an ambiguity which always comes across when we deal with health data. However, if you look into other legislation which currently exist in the ecosystem wherein, you know, we have been retaining data. There have been like different acts in which it has been mentioned that you have to retain data. For, for example, in the MC, uh, MCI Code of Ethics, it says that you have to do it for three years. In several other acts. Yes, that is for the fiduciary. That is for fiduciary. That is for yeah. the rule applies to the fiduciary. Now I'm asking from the point of the processor, because processor has to hold the data. The sub subscriber, that the fiduciary is not paying the. Uh, ah, I mean, so that depends. Processor. So basically, see, as a, so as a processor, you are liable under the contract with your data fiduciary. So yeah, in the I end, it depends on the data fiduciary and the the contract that you might have executed with the data fiduciary as to. Until when do you have to retain so, uh, the data? What we're trying to say over here is that the data fiduciary and the processor will have the, they'll have a watertight contract which has to be uh, established. So both of them have a uh, contractual relationship over here. So the data fiduciary uh, will have the onus of retention and not the data processor. So you ensure whenever you're going into contracts with data fiduciary, you'll have to read through the contract and see which is, as you said, like you, you can incur more cost, right? So you'll have to ensure that those uh, clauses are inserted into the contract before you proceed with anything. Okay. So yes. basically, Act has given onus on uh, data fiduciary. That data fiduciary yes. has to take care that what whosoever is a data processor who is processing on his behalf has to adhere all the rules, yes. all the provisions and uh, security measures as per the Act, what data fiduciary is also adhering to. So uh, that is... Uh, what yeah. presently there is in the act, and, and also the, the act, officer. and yeah. also the act has mentioned that they will come up with prospective rules on aspects pertaining to retention. So maybe we wait for the same if they come up with some sectoral specific guidelines or rules pertaining to health sector, financial sector, because I'm sure the ecosystem understands that health data is a very different type of data as compared to all the other types. So yeah, we just need to be patient and wait what rules will come out in the future. Uh, regarding your question concerning date appointment of a data protection officer. So the thing is that this is a compulsion if you are a significant data fiduciary. So again, if the central government will notify you or a class of data fiduciaries as a significant data fiduciary, only then you will fall under this purview and you'll have to appoint a data protection officer. Now that is irrespective of the size of the hospital or the number of patients, number of beds, because if you fall under this category, you will have to appoint a data protection officer from your end. And uh, the third question on insurance. In uh, what the is concern, many patients, many patients who are educated, especially they have a ABA card, they have everything. And they are not letting us to share the data because they are preventing us uh, because the data may flow to the insurance people and it can increase their... Uh, issues and all that they are asking how should we convince is there any way that we can convince these patients uh, that this is not going to happen is there any mechanism um, or something is required as it has become a one of the roadblocks of, for implementing abdm see this uh, the, it purely depends upon how we educate the data principal over here we have to make them aware of their rights which they have so once yes. you uh, once there is awareness about the rights the data principal will be more comfortable in sharing his data Secondly, about the part uh, about them selling it to insurance companies and all, the data fiduciary over here has an obligation to ensure that it will be only used for the purpose which it, he has already specified in the notice. So if the notice but does not specify... But when it goes to the PHR, it goes to his digital locker, sir. When it goes to the PHR, the data flows into the digital locker, which is out of the uh, capacity for the fiduciary to take care of it. When it goes to digital locker, it's totally is out. Uh, that is my concern because fiduciary holds in his pocket, but what happens when it reaches the digital locker, which is not in the reach of the fiduciary, neither he has anything to do. That is a, a concern few of the patient expressed about the digital locker, the data going into the digital locker. 
yes but like just um thinking out loud if if it goes out of your control uh, because i'm sure digilocker is in the hands of the owner then it's in the hands yes, of right. the data principal so in the end then it's up to them basically this is a consent based mechanism mm -hmm. so even if you educate the data and if the data anyways goes out of your hand and if it goes to digilocker with the data principal so then it's up to them what they want to do with their data so even mm -hmm. if you educate them even if you do anything if they still refuse to share that data then it's a refusal of consent and you, you actually you cannot do it and as uh, kavati oh. mentioned if it is in the purpose if it's in the specified purpose while collecting their consent then i'm sure you can share it with the insurance um okay. companies yeah, yes. but based mm. on the consent yes sir digi locker it is uh, i thought it is in the under the control of the phr people who are maintaining this that was my Uh, so, uh, Umesh ji, uh, we would request you that you may kindly write us uh, in regard of your question, so that we yes. can research on it and come back to you. Yes, thank you, thank you, sir. Okay, that will work. Yes, thank you, sir. Right, sir. Oh, yes. Thank you. Okay, Umesh. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, can we have uh, Mr. Suresh? Can you please unmute yourself and ask a question? <coughs> Yeah. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. You are audible. Yeah. I am representing HDFC Ergo General Insurance Company Limited. So also pertaining to the ABHA ID and the ABDM framework. So uh, I I understand that these rules are yet to be framed and uh, we will get more clarity. But as of now, uh, I just want to know what is your opinion. The data is flowing under a ABA ID purely based on the consent given by the individual. So the respective insurer will be a data processor here or a data fiduciary according to you. Uh, will the insurance company be a data processor? Yeah, yeah. Um, the insur the insurance company in this case would be a data fiduciary because you will determine. why you are processing the data and how you are going to process the data and what are the purposes for processing the data so in this case the insurance companies would be data fiduciaries so so effectively we are saying uh, nha and the respective insurer both are data fiduciaries in this case yes yes Definitely. i am i am only getting limited health related data in respect of this individual which is uh, as i said it is consent driven as in when he or she is approaching me for a health policy and as per the irda and the other regulatory framework i approach you that you know these are the details required as if it's a pre existing disease what hospitalization he has undergone those details are the restricted details that i you know i am getting from you now the other gentleman was asking that you know this this data is flowing to the insurer but now this is mandatory the, i have to underwrite the policy i have to you know look at what risk is getting underwritten here and then there is another requirement of kyc which of course is between the individual and the insurer mm -hmm. so do you think that we are going to be the data processor in respect of the limited data uh, set point no you would still be the data fiduciary in this uh, case okay thank you yeah thank, thank you. you thank you so much suresh uh can we have uh, nitin could you please unmute yourself and ask a question hi good morning uh, good morning ma'am good morning sir uh, i am from uh, neva bupa health insurance so i have just fundamental questions here when we talk about consent so today when we sell health insurance suppose you are buying as a proposer and you are buying for your uh, spouse and kids we take consent from the proposer so first step is we don't take consent from spouse and kids so spouse and kids in many areas might not be knowing that their policy is being bought for them so we start from there so going forward do we have to take suppose there is one adult two child or two adult two child or you know uh, any combination of family do we have to take consent from each family member that policy is being bought for you yes 
you'd have to take as see as far as we're going about uh, when you talk about a child then obviously the lawful guardian would be the parent natural guardian the natural guardian would be the parent so then the, you have to take consent of the parent otherwise if you're talking about so, uh, if like a, so do we have to change that and will there be so a like, recommendation coming from iirdi that the process has to be changed you need to take consent from parents suppose you are buying for your parents suppose you are buying for your spouse and kids so all six consents need to be taken separately stored with us yes you have to and take consent from all of them if that question is yes yeah and uh, okay. uh, while so probably have you have just for more rules there yeah. you have just talked about a combination that there are uh, uh, two adults and two children and two uh, one adult and two children every adult consent you have to take it specifically and for the child you can take consent of their lawful guardian or natural guardian so that you have to and if we are capturing so in health insurance we also capture nominee names so do we have to Jee. take consent from the person who is being nominated no you don't have to because like today if you uh, open a fixed deposit yeah so today data, you open a fixed deposit in the bank data principle has been enumerated with right to nomination also under this act which we will be covering tomorrow mm -hmm. and uh, okay while uh, taking the uh, name of nominee you don't have to take consent from nominee for that purpose for your insurance purpose okay and uh, another leading question is when we take a consent we take only one consent so we don't take that uh, you are sharing your phone number email id postal address your obesity or your disease you are not we are not taking consent line wise so it is one consent so will that continue or do we have to take line wise consent that every parameter or if there are 30 fields do we have to take consent on 30 fields um so as we spoke that while collecting consent you need to specify the purposes for which you have you are taking that consent so um while seeking that consent yeah of course blanket consent is absolutely not allowed in the act so what you are saying is a single point of consent where you take consent once and then you continue processing data on for whatever purposes um for that blanket consent so that is not allowed under the act you can take consent for the specified purposes and if you process the data for any other purpose you need to seek fresh consent from the data principal so that is why we said that furnishing a notice and how you furnish the notice to the data principal is really important because that will determine the means of processing the data that you have in hand so if you put in the notice all the purposes or any other related purposes with for which you might be processing the data and if the principal consents to the same then you are good to go but you cannot otherwise process data for any other purposes so this blanket consent is not permitted under the act okay so there are many more questions i'll just take one more and then probably will i'll write a email to you uh, suppose right. the now the requester bought a policy Years and he does not renew the policy, and he says delete my data. So uh, he says now that I am not no more your customer, you delete my data. So in our processes, we keep the data for deduce purposes, so that the customer comes back after three years. I know that he was earlier my customer. He had certain uh, declarations. so that i can you know refer to those things but if i delete the data i will lose entire claim history i will lose entire uh, declarations which happened so how is the act around that so uh, as per the act there are two conditions wherein uh, one can deny of deleting or erasing the data if a principal has accounted for one is that it is needed for specified purpose and second is that a lawful retention is available so in this case if a, a data principal has requested to delete or erase their data and uh, they have they withdrawn their consent for further processing now you have to delete that data only and until you are uh, eligible to maintain it for a lawful uh, purpose as enumerated in any of the law of the land and for a specified purpose otherwise you have to delete it no other excuses available um do you have any more questions nitin uh, 
there are many but i'll probably write a email now we have your email address so right, we can right. write we it and give it to you we're just sharing the email id in the chat, chat box so kindly send it yeah. very so because there are many actually it is uh, the way we work sure. today and the way act wants us so 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 and then i'm just uh, sharing the email id in the chat right now thank you sir and thank for you. for whoever who has asked for the presentation uh, we'll be uploading it yeah. on the website soon so don't worry you will get the entire ppt maybe after tomorrow when we complete the presentation we'll upload it and um, you can then access it through the website uh, next sir can we have dr naresh agarwal to please unmute yourself and ask a question good morning to all sir i am audible yes yes, yes. ha uh, i am a private consultant to the private healthcare establishment and uh, i am here as a reseller to the nice hms but after going through this whole discussion now i am a quite a worried person as a doctor so my straight forward question as a doctor or consultant or as a hospital owner you make it sure that whatever the litigations nitty gritty is involved in all this protection data protection act and the health protection act being a consultant or hospital staff we are just a data processor or we are something else than data processor this is my first question then uh, i will sir, give sorry, the leading uh, sorry to interrupt sorry to interrupt you uh, could you please repeat your question uh, so are you trying to tell us that as a doctor are you a data processor in an organ you're working for an hospital is that your question actually sir uh, actually sir i am a reseller also for the softwares there is uh, the system is uh, there is a one side is a software provider abdm compatible software provider and other part is a hospital who and uh, the hospital which purchase a software that is all entering a data opd by the consultant ipd by whole staff nurse there are so many people that are involved in this uh, all they are all are data processor first point and second whatever the legality is involved in it that is up to the data uh, to sendry you can say that the software provider this is my question okay uh, first of all uh, dr naresh i would like to tell you that there is no need to be concerned um if you are working in the hospital as a doctor then you will be the data fiduciary because you will be getting the patient data and you will be processing it from your end and from the perspective of a software provider where you are saying that if you sell the software to the hospital if you have as we have mentioned time and again if you have entered into a contract with the hospital to process the data on their behalf so basically if your software is processing the data on the behalf of the hospital then you will fall under the category of a data processor and so whatever the obligations or whatever is enlisted in the contract with the hospital you as a data processor will have to adhere to the same and um, yeah but as we had mentioned in the general obligations of the data fiduciary that no matter what the the major liability for any kind of a breach or an event of a breach would still be in the hands of the data fiduciary so as a processor you don't have to worry a lot the act is kind of quite lenient when it comes to uh, the category of data of a data processor so yeah so in the first uh, scenario you will be a data fiduciary working as a healthcare provider in a hospital and as a software seller if the hospital is using your software and you have entered into a contract and you are processing the data on behalf of the hospital then you will be a data processor in the scenario does that answer your question uh, definitely definitely yes. madam uh, right. and uh, thank you thank you a lot thank you so much can we have dr pankaj telyani could you please unmute yourself and ask your question yeah uh, good morning everyone i am dr pankaj uh, my question is around this uh, disha how is it like uh, disha is not uh, similar like uh, dpdp what is the difference between disha and dpdp this act disha and has it, anyways been repealed so, so there is no point in kind of 
thinking about like no disha doesn't exist disha doesn't exist disha it, has been it was already merged in dpd uh, pdp at the time uh, when yeah, they were discussing yeah and since then the act has been uh, repealed matlab the ministry called for that disha from the uh, other ministry and they merged it and uh, it was assumed that that we will take care of the provisions of a similar nature in our <coughs> act also so as of now uh, disha is not in picture Place, at so all so you don't have to concern yourself uh, uh-huh. with that okay Uh, one more question uh, uh, it's around our organization i work for wipro as a senior consultant so we have developed an in house product amrit application which is uh, implemented in bihar and assam state and that is meant for uh, early childhood development uh, uh, population as well as for mother and child tracking system so this is like for post and prenatal as well as antenatal care so how dpdp act can help us or in 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 doing the privacy of a patient record or like how this can uh, create an impact can you can you guide us like you have to adhere to all the provisions pertaining to child uh, because uh, as your uh, applications which you are talking about is concerned with the processing of uh, data pertaining to a child so uh, while uh, you are processing data you have to take consent of their lawful guardian and their natural guardian whosoever is present at the time and uh, while processing you have to take care that no such process take place which is detrimental to the child uh, health or child uh, uh, mental capacity and uh, no such advertisement should be done by your organization which is targeting or monitoring or uh, taking care of tracking in any kind of a child behavior so for the child you have to do that and for the mother care uh, it is in general that you have to adhere to whatever obligations are uh, enumerated under dpdp act and i believe that wipro will also fall under the significant data fiduciary so you should pull up your socks and uh, start uh, uh, engaging in uh, appointing all the provisions accordingly okay one last question uh, is it like similar like an hipaa guidelines what what they use in us i think comparing this to hipaa would not be apt because we are a common law country and they're not first of all and this is this is considering hipaa is basically for health check and this dpdp or dpdp act is a general guideline for all sectoral uh, uh, so i don't think comparing hipaa and dpdp act is a fair thing to do Okay, that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Bhagat. Can we have Dr. Pallavi Roy? Could you please unmute yourself? Hi. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, sorry, I need to drop off, so I just uh, wanted to ask a quick question. I've uh, shared it in the chat box as well for your reference. So, uh, I mean, during the presentation, you mentioned a couple of boards that a consent manager is supposed to be registered with. Um. Uh, You said that there has to be a chosen, and they have to register with the board. So I just wanted to know how are they chosen, and uh, what is the process for them to get registered with the board? And uh, I mean, when we speak of this board or board of directors, which I believe you mentioned again when we spoke about the data protection officer, are they? Um, I mean, are these boards? Uh, you know, the board of directors for a particular HMIS or an integrated partner or I mean, what is the entity? Uh, hi, Pallavi. So, uh, it's not a lot of boards. It's just one board, which is the Data Protection Board of India. Um, tomorrow we'll uh, tell. So, it is basically an authority which will kind of govern the um entire uh, digital personal uh, data uh, ecosystem in India. So, the when I when we say that consent manager should be registered with the board. the board is the data protection board of india that's it uh, the act has also mentioned that uh, soon they are going to come out with the process of registration and the accountability and obligations of consent managers they are going to come out with rules these are going to be prospective rules which will hopefully be published by the end of this year so it will in detail lay down the obligations the process of registration and everything that a consent manager should adhere to so it is just one single board which is the primary uh, board which will be established and uh, if you have time tomorrow then please join we'll 
uh, further carry on the discussion on the data protection board of india so it's just one board they, 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 there are understood. no multiple entities understood yeah. thank you so much thank you right. yeah i'll thank be joining you. it yeah okay. thank you very much uh, dr naresh agarwal is requested to kindly unmute yourself oh. hello sir i have a one request for you sir can i have Uh, Narish, we cannot hear. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, I have a one request for you as a ABDM team. Can I have? Sure, sure, please. Please go ahead. Ah, actually, uh, what uh, my taking so far from your this section is that the document between a software vendor and the hospital is their agreement, right? Yes. What type of agreement they will go? at a time of uh, this uh, implementation of software and uh, if uh, there any support from abdm team and from your legal team that the what type of the provision should be added in uh, agreement in the light of this new data protection act if it is possible uh, i think the data fiduciary will be determining all these things and what clauses to are uh, to be added so if you can just i provided you the email id in the chat so if you can just write all your queries over there so we can just write uh, write to you about this and okay. uh, dr narish the thing is that it is a very subjective uh, thing like what you're talking about so it depends completely on the data fiduciary it's a case to case basis kind of a thing like what they need and what you have to provide to them based on their needs so it is really difficult for us to, even if we tell you a template it will be a standard template of a contract which will have the general provisions so you know if you're looking for something specific then i don't think we might be able to assist yeah. you a lot we can just tell you the i would like to contribute by saying that uh, it is the dptp act has given a general perspective that you have to adhere all these provisions while you are dealing with digital personal data okay and now further if uh, you are into a business it is totally up to you that what kind of contract you are entering into while adhering to the provisions of the dptp act so uh, it will totally depend upon the facts and circumstances at that time and what are your business needs okay oh, thank you thank you thank you dr nish dr deepak could you please unmute yourself <laughs> thanks for the elaborate presentation this is dr deepak from everwell So we are the data processors for uh, National Tuberculosis Elimination Program via NICSHA MIS. So tuberculosis is a public health disease, and it's notified as a threat to public health. And we manage all patient-wise information in the MIS. So as a data processor, uh, does the Act allow us to process the information without explicit consent, or would be required to take consent to process the data? Over. The thing is that. You you are processing the data on behalf of Nikshay, so they are the data fiduciaries. Mm. So it is completely the onus is not on you. You just have to do what Nikshay asks you to do. So seeking consent and all of those okay. things okay. are not. It's it's it doesn't fall under your um. It's not your purview. Like it doesn't fall under your purview to do all those things. So be it seeking consent or be it seek processing data without consent, it is completely on the fiduciary, which is Nikshay, and whatever they ask you to process, you just have to do that. So even if even if there is any liability, uh, where maybe Nikshay is not complying with the provisions of the Act, then there will be no onus on you. You don't have to worry about being liable for the same. So yeah, I hope that answers your um, question. But that doesn't mean that uh, yeah, you, you can blindly, go blindly <laughs> process, <laughs> process anything. You have to adhere to all the provisions, security measures, and uh, uh, whatever act is saying as per in accordance with the whatever data fiduciary is adhering to. So you cannot go beyond that. Got it. Got it. Thank you. Ah. Thank, Thank you. you. Can we have? Uh, Gopak Kumar, can you please unmute yourself? Yeah, hi. So I am from Agilas Limited. So we are one of the leading pathology uh, diagnostic centers in India. So I'd like to have, uh, I'd like to know whether uh, how does the concern work where we are using one mobile number for multiple uh, uh, means patients in a home. 
so in a home in the family we'll be using a single mobile number for multiple people right so in that case how does the concern work Uh, just give us a second, sir, please. Just one second. Yeah. Uh, so, Gopal Kumar, we'll just uh, this will come under the rights of a data uh, uh, principle. So, let me just cover this tomorrow, and uh, we'll get back to you on this question uh, tomorrow. Once we uh, go okay. through. Okay. So, there is Thanks. one more question, one last question. So, while uh, sending a test, uh, remain days to the patient. Uh, does uh, concern apply there? Sorry, can you repeat yourself? Your voice cracked. What? So while we send this reminder to the patient, does a, does the concern apply there? Uh, you are saying that as per the definition, uh, whether you fall, I, I cannot understand. Can you, can you please repeat yourself? I'm sorry. Okay, so there will be routine tests conducted by patients, right? There are some people who conduct routine tests. So in that case, we are sending them reminders for that. In that case, how does the concern work? to take the consent Consent. while you will uh, serve them the notice that what all uh, data you are going to process of that particular person. So you basically have you'll have to, uh, whenever you're sending out reminder, when he first comes for his routine checkup, just uh, take consent from him that we'll be sending, sending you reminders. And if you are reminders and notification, if he consents to that, only then can you send him reminders and notifications for that. Oh, okay, fine. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mohit, could you please unmute yourself? Okay, uh, can we have, uh, please unmute yourself. Uh, can, can you please unmute yourself and ask a question? Good morning, everybody. Am I audible? Hi, yes, Hi, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm from Droke Private Limited, which is a private HMS player. So my, uh, I also had a few questions which uh, has already been answered to other members. So my basic questions to you is uh, like how this data, uh, sorry, consent withdrawal system works. Like, um, let's say the, uh, I mean, typically, you know, there are uh, some mechanism in place for individuals to withdraw their consent in this HMIS uh, software, right? right? But if the data processing is based on this consent, the individuals generally have the right to withdraw their consent. And the data fiduciary must stop processing the data, right? So how does this basically happen? And uh, in case the data fiduciary fails to do so, what are the consequences that has to be faced by the particular organization? So uh, we will be covering this uh, under the penalty provisions, which we will discuss tomorrow. But for your clarification, if uh, any person has withdrawn and opted out by uh, taking their consent away, so whatever in retrospective effect you have taken consent for, you will process till that uh, point of time. But from the day when the consent has been withdrawn, you have to specifically stop processing the data from that particular point of time without fail. Otherwise, you may encounter penalties up to 250 crore. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, Mohit, <laughs> could you please unmute uh, yourself? Uh, am I audible? Yes. yes. Okay. I think there was some issue earlier. So, so couple of questions. Uh, one is uh, around the notice uh, that has to be provided. So, uh, I, I understand that the the purpose and the all, all the other aspects has to be. 
you know. But uh, when it comes to providing the notice, uh, and I think a gentleman before uh, also asked, uh, how explicit? I mean, for example, let's say uh, so. My understanding is, let's say if I have to collect consent for the purpose of providing an insurance, I need to only mention some of the things that are needed to achieve my objective or to achieve to provide to service to provide the service right but not the or but not all the fields that i'll be collecting from the user uh, or, or the buyer right uh, from that perspective is it correct so the purpose has to be purpose have to be exhausted but the all the fields that would be required uh, needs to be specified in the notice right so you'll have to tell what data you'll be collecting. That's the first thing. The purpose, as well as what data you're collecting, and what will be you, uh, what will the data will, uh, what the data will be used for. So you have to tell what fields are you talking about over here precisely. You'll have to mention that too, right? Okay. So let's say I'm I'm just yeah. stating it out. A demographic yeah. information is a category of information which covers age, height, gender, and all of that, right? And a couple yeah. of uh, more fields, right? So just mentioning the demographics fields would do. You know, all You'll the have to mention, you have to mention them in detail. It will be better if you mention them in detail because demographic might just cover something. So as Ashka, like uh, previously said, you, it can't be a blanket uh, kind of a thing. Like you can't just say I'm collecting your demographic details. So you'll have to kind of specify it. Once. App talks about informed consent. And informed consent means that the particular data principal should be aware that how and for what purposes his data or her data is going to be utilized by data petition. Good. And uh, so, uh, just you know, just a uh, follow up question on this. Uh, if a notice has to be provided, so the notice also has to be, it's like, uh, I mean, uh, one that is, so one is that is, it is clearly visible, and the second is it is visible, but maybe, uh, uh, you know, not that co completely visible on the, let's say, if, I, if, I'm, if I'm using a phone, right? Usually, how the notices are provided is that you, they provide an eye icon, and you click on the eye icon, and you know, then you click on get the consent. So, to what extent uh, the visibility uh, should be of the notice on the platforms that the user is going to use? I mean, are there any provisions in around uh, around that? I mean, uh, um, so there are no like provisions as such for that. But as a recommendation, we would suggest that you know it would be beneficial if you make it clearly visible for your benefit because anyways you will have to give them a notice. So there is no point in kind of having the having it not clearly visible so you know it, it would be better if you clearly make it visible for and for the specified purposes um that you would want to furnish the uh, yeah got it and uh, all right. so, uh, i have two more questions if you don't mind all right uh one is uh, the last and i think someone touched on this one also erase of personal data so uh let's say if uh I am someone who is going to process the information. Uh, so let's say if I'm a health insurance company or I'm a health tech company, uh, then uh, I have processed the information, but I have anonymized the data. Again, I I can I, I would be using that anonymized data to predict a lot of uh, 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 issues that a person could be happening, right? The, for example, the person might be a risk of a cardiac arrest, right? So I... I data to intimate later on to the let, let's say it's a, it's a company right let's say it's pwc or infosys right so i, I i'm in a b2b relationship where the anonymized data that i have i use it for the purposes of uh, administrating better services so does the anonymized data has also has to be deleted or it's only the one that is that could be attributed to a specific individual um so first of all uh, anonymized data will not fall under the purview of uh, personal data because the uh, you won't be able to identify the data principle in any manner so you know if you anonymize the data then it won't uh, fall under the purview of this act because it's not a personal data anymore so and also the act also states that they will come up with retention anonymization and rules on all of these questions that even we have all these questions but uh, they are going to uh, come up with prospective rules on the same. However, uh, this is our understanding that anonymization does not fall under uh, personal data, so it doesn't fall under Got the act. Got it. That's so, uh, so while you will serve him the notice, you will clearly mention that uh, your data will be 
anonymized and then further will be used for research statistical or archival right. purpose so uh, you know you're good you with anonymized have, data so you don't have to worry about that I, but we have to ensure yeah. but yeah, we have yeah, to ensure yeah. that we delete the personal data personal attributes so that even we cannot trace it to the exactly uh, exactly that is specified exactly all the personal identifiable information should be removed, removed. and that's that uh, and the next question is let's say if i am a doctor and i am using an hms platform so uh, and since you know uh, covid basically uh, exposed this that having an understanding of let's say if, if i am in the city of delhi and in delhi uh, can i use the data of uh, so uh, an hms player can give the insights or the statistical analysis to the doctors to which the patient to which he uh, to the patients he is administering to my question is let's say if i am a doctor and i am i'm i'm you know i'm consulting thousands of patients so can i can an hms player give me statistical insights to only those patients who who i am consulting would that be um, uh, so tomorrow we will be covering uh, there are certain exemptions provided under the act wherein uh, your question falls under uh, usage of uh, data in hand for statistical purposes so uh, tomorrow we will be con it falls under an exemption in the act so for the clarity for others also uh, if you can be patient and if you will be available tomorrow for the session sure. we are going to address this question in a much better detailed uh, manner so um, yeah that works uh, yeah perfect. and the last question that i have is how to yeah. al although i have understood the demarcation line between the data fiduciary and data processor but i mean if you can you know just clearly call out uh, for a no if, if i have to explain it to a you know uh, a beginner right i mean what basically is it only that the per is it only that the purpose the, the one who specifies the purpose and the one who uh, is the data fiduciary uh, that distinguish between the data fiduciary and data processor or there are other points as well no it's only this that if the data comes with you and you decide how you are processing the data and why you are processing the data then you are the data fiduciary and if you appoint someone to process the data on your behalf so that does not mean that the data processor will determine the means and purpose for processing the data it still lies in the hand of the data fiduciary only so that is the clear demarcation uh, which has been laid down in the act right. that uh, data processor will not determine any means or the reasons for processing the data that is still in the hands of the fiduciary only data processor will abide to all the rules regulation provisions which data fiduciary is abiding to under the act so so more right. the basic demarcation which you want to somehow if you see in a layman's term would be like a contractor subcontractor kind of uh -huh. relationship so the contractor here would be the data fiduciary and the subcontractor would be the data processor i hope right. that clarifies it yeah yeah thank you so much right. thank you mohit uh, can i have uh, sevawali nathan to unmute himself Can we have Seva Bali Nathan to please unmute himself? Ask a question, please. Hello. Yes. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Uh, so this is Dr. Seva Bali Nathan. I am uh, looking after Nikshay with the Central DB Division. So this is in continuation of the question which Mr. Deepak had raised. So in terms of consent, deciding on uh, whether consent is required or not. So ultimately, the data fiduciary needs to take the call uh, in compliance with the new policy. Uh, am I right? Yes. Yes. Okay. So this is in context of the ABDM integration also. So, uh, and when you say data fiduciary, just a basic doubt. Uh, with respect to health, is it uh, the uh, subdivision that is the central DB division which will be taking the call, or is it the ministry per se who will take the call? Uh, which uh context will require a concern and which context will not require a concern uh, do you have any clarity on that um so the act is clear as we mentioned uh the certain legitimate uses that we spoke about so if your activity falls under that purview that's when an explicit consent is not required otherwise you'll have to take consent mm -hmm. and basically the thing is that the act does see the thing is that it it it's a general framework for every kind of digital personal data and not specifically healthcare 
so we need to keep in mind that the act is very generic in nature in terms of when they talk about consent or when they talk about consent for certain legitimate uses every so uh, so every sector has to adhere to the act and if and when if there are any future sectoral specific guidelines then we'll have to adhere to the same but that is completely in the hands of um, the central government so uh, okay. yes okay. thank you thank you thank you very much uh, umesh could you please unmute yourself yes sir i was uh, uh, thinking about anonymization or uh, pseudo anonymization the question is there will be definite and commercial interest involved when you sell that uh, anonymous data to companies like cwc or infosys and how does this because this is more often done by the processor rather than the fiduciary fiduciary may or may not be knowing what data is being used for now the processor should inform the fiduciary that his data or a group of all fiduciaries that he is holding is using it for giving it to the other companies to because there will definitely commercial interest and should he inform them or he can do it without the first question the second uh, question is we've already uh, sorry yes sir so processor can't do anything unless it has been told by the fiduciary so he cannot go uh, above and beyond whatever if the fiduciary yes, doesn't to do a body and yes, if the commercial interest is in what in anonymization also should the principal also come to know this about this yes yeah yeah as we said that whenever you are seeking consent if you are going to anonymize the data and um, use it further you have to seek consent for the same from the data principal so they should be aware that okay you are taking my data and you are going to anonymize my data and use it for other purposes so as a data principal i must know at the point of giving the consent that there are chances that my data would be anonymized so and used in the future it will be sold so that that means sir before before pushing to the sms the patient should know that his data may be used for anonymized and later on used for some commercial yes. or research yes. or whatever yes. he should be informed yeah, yeah. in any yes. case of yes. 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 All right. Thank you, Mesh. All right. Thank you, everyone. Yes, sir. So we'll. Uh, thank you, everyone. For if are there any more questions? We'll just wait for a couple of minutes. If there are any more questions. No more questions. Okay. Uh, if there's anything else, we request uh, everyone to email on the ID provided in the chat box. And uh, apart from that, tomorrow uh, there'll be the second part of the session. and the timings are going to be the same uh, a lot of your questions were not addressed today as we are going to cover it tomorrow so it will be in the better interest if there are more people joining it will be more insightful for others as well and uh, thank you very much everyone it has been a great discussion and uh, all the questions even made us gain a lot of insight into the act and um, it was a really fun and interactive session and we'll see you tomorrow thank you very much thank you thank you Thank you.